This video is brought to you by Wix. What's up guys, Michael here. I have a question. When's the last time you went to the movies specifically to see a comedy? What about a rom-com? If you're like most Americans, it's probably been a minute. People in general are skipping out on your classic funny bone tickling films, and comedies that succeed at the box office are becoming the exception rather than the rule. We're seeing lots of comedies flounder this year, from Booksmart to The Beach Bum to The Long Shot to Late Night and on and on and on. Even Men in Black International only pulled in 250 million, a pale comparison to the 624 million its predecessor, Men in Black 3 made. Indeed, you could almost hear the industry breathe a collective sigh of relief when the recent comedy Good Boys hit 21 million in its opening weekend, making it one of only two comedies to hit number one in the box office this year. Comscore media analyst Paul Durgarabedian summed up the situation saying, this is like a unicorn sighting. Even so, 21 million is a sum that probably wouldn't have even made us blink circa the summer of 2009 when The Hangover pulled in a cool 45 million during its opening weekend. If you scan a list of top performing films of the late 90s or even the early to mid aughts, a whole lot of them are comedies. What happened to the days when Austin Powers ruled the box office? Where's our 2019 Pretty Woman? And just for argument's sake, why no Hangover 4? The truth is, traditional film subgenres like the rom com or those gross out comedies of the 1990s seem about as culturally relevant as a late night sock hop at a high school gymnasium. But before you grab that comedy shaped casket from your closet, let's look a little closer. Is comedy really dead? What if it never even existed in the first place? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on the maybe death of comedy. But before we get into that, I wanna give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Wix. With Wix, you can create your own unique website perfect for any occasion. Whether you're planning your wedding, building a personal portfolio, or launching an online store, Wix has everything you need to create a functioning masterpiece. With Wix, you can share photos and videos and even host music. Connect your socials and add all kinds of tools that will make your website professional and robust. Once you're set up, Wix will give you access to all your analytics so you can see where your site's traffic is coming from and so much more. And if you upgrade to Wix Premium, you can get unlimited bandwidth and access to VIP priority support. Create your own unique website today by clicking here or going to wix.com slash wisecrack and get 15% off all yearly plans by using promo code wisecrack15. Now, back to the show. We think a quick recap of the current comedy landscape is in order. News outlets like The Hollywood Reporter have made a habit of sounding the alarm about the death of comedy films. We're treated to ever more dire statistics showing comedic box office flops. And we're seeing fewer total laugh out loud comedies. Total box office revenue for comedy shrank from 2.5 billion in 2009 to just 1 billion in 2018. In 2018, comedies accounted for just 7.2% of all domestic box office revenue. So what made traditional comedy films an endangered species? The easy answer might be the ever-expanding number of streaming services, but the real answer is a little more complicated. Also, it involves China. As you, presumably a human being watching YouTube, certainly know, consumers have more entertainment options than ever before. You can stream anything your heart desires on 10 different competing platforms or watch your best to eat Tide Pods on YouTube. Note that these alternatives are typically cheaper than a movie ticket. And how does a studio deal with the competition from all these sick TikTok compilations? They're going international, or at least more international. Studios are coping with domestic losses by trying to maximize their profits in places like China, Japan, India, and France. Indeed, in 2018, Warner Brothers earned just $1.9 billion in North America, compared to a hefty $3.6 billion overseas. Across the board, international audiences are booming, and the Motion Picture Association of America predicts that China will soon overtake the US as the largest movie market in the world. But how does one make an American film with widespread international appeal? It's not necessarily Meg Ryan really enjoying the sandwich. Yes! 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 Oh! I'll have what she's having. Instead, it's usually fast cars, big guns, and a superhero or two, or three, or 10. Indeed, comic book films and action flicks are a perfect fit for the international audience as they peddle largely in special effects that can be appreciated regardless of your language or culture. As non-dialogue heavy films, they also require less pesky dubbing or subtitles while offering the universal appeal of watching sh blow up. In contrast, comedies are not as easy to port over to a Bangladeshi theater screen. You'd better tell the captain we've got to land as soon as we can. This woman has to be gotten to a hospital. A hospital? What is it? It's a big building with patients, but that's not important right now. That's because comedies rely a lot on cultural specificity. Shake it back! Just think about how different the British office is from its American counterpart. Go, my right-hand man, immediately. 
beneath me. Oh, has an actor said to a bishop? <laughs> no, he's not. You always left me satisfied and smiling, so. That's what she said. <laughs> or how the show also spawned iterations in places like India, Chile, and Finland, all with their own cultural quirks. If you're still thinking comedy can transcend international borders no problem, peep this Chinese comedy, God of Cookery. If you're not from China, is this funny to you? Probably not. The Rock breaking out of a cast with his bicep might be universal, but it's hard to make a comedy that really appeals to the international masses. Thus, studios aren't really investing in developing new comedy scripts the way that they used to. Judd Apatow, the literal creator of the modern Ford Assembly line of comedies, echoes this argument, telling IndieWire that comedy film basically died after the last writer's strike, which ended in 2008. Apatow says, I feel like the studios don't buy as many scripts now. As a result, a lot of great comedy writers are going to television instead. So there you have it. Our investigation comes to a close. Say goodbye to all your favorite forms of comedy, from star vehicles for people like Will Ferrell and Meg Ryan, to quality parodies like Scary Movie, to delightful gross-out comedies like There's Something About Mary. Instead, if you feel like laughing, looks like you're going to have to stick to TikTok. But wait, what about this? As far as I'm concerned, that's America's ass. That line brought the house down. Or take this moment from Get Out. I'm T.S. motherfucking A. We handle shit. It's genuinely funny, right? Indeed, comedian Jordan Peele's seamless transition into the horror genre hasn't stopped him from showcasing his sense of humor. Even though we're buying a ticket to see a horror film, we also walk in pretty sure that something's going to make us laugh. By the way, I, I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. Has comedy just undergone some kind of metamorphosis? To understand the comic forces at play in a Marvel movie like Endgame or a horror film like Get Out, we'll need to take a look at film scholar Jeff King. In his book Film Comedy, King basically says that the term comedy can't be fully understood as just a genre, arguing that it is so widespread as to be difficult to locate as a single or stable generic form. Instead, he suggests looking at comedy as a mode. But what's a mode, and how is it different than a genre? Simply put, a genre is a category of film. Take, for example, the Western. Nearly all films within a genre will share certain essential narratives, characters, or other features, like setting. Westerns typically have a rugged cowboy, an expansive, dusty American landscape, an aesthetically unappealing villain, and some form of a gunfight. Both the classic High Noon and the unclassic Wild Wild West share these features, and thus, both are Westerns. In contrast, a mode is a manner of presentation. It's a mood or feeling, and all the choices that contribute to that mood. It's helpful here to think of how mode works in music. A musical mode is a scale with specific notes and melodic features. Take the Dorian mode, made up of these notes arranged in this manner. Both the traditional hymn, Drunken Sailor, and the Latin jazz song, Oyo Como Va, are written in the Dorian mode, though the two songs belong to radically different genres. Similarly in film, both Shazam and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood use a comedic mode, though the former is also a superhero flick and the latter is also a thriller and drama. Got it? So King's argument goes, because any genre may be treated as a subject for comedy, it's more accurate to see it as a mode, a modifier of other genres, rather than simply one in its own right. While film comedy was published back in 2002, we'd argue that King's point offers a lens to look at comedy that is even more relevant today. Fewer comedy movies are made than ever before, and the ones that are made fail at the box office. But we might still laugh at the movies just as much. So King's diagnosis of comedy as more of a mode than a genre rings truer than ever before. But how exactly does this mode of comedy manifest in movies? At first glance, that seems simple. Comedy is what makes you laugh. The next 9-11 is going to be on some geriatric <laughs> But what if, say, in the cinematic masterpiece, The Room, the filmmaker wasn't trying to make you laugh? You are tearing me apart, Lisa! And what if a comedy film like Bad Santa doesn't make you laugh, even though it's trying to? It's more complicated than just eliciting a laugh. It needs to be intentional. King expands his definition of comedy in film as a mode that tends to involve departures from what are considered to be the normal routines of life of the social group in question. Take a normal situation. You're at a grocery store. Then add a departure from your norm. You're wearing a bathrobe and sandals and have to write a check for 69 cents. Ta-da! You have comedy. The form of comedy can vary. It can result from incongruity, like a superhero hanging out in a convenience store, or it can result from exaggeration, like the dad's over-the-top attempt to sound like a tough guy in Us. So if y'all wanna get crazy, we can get crazy. Ultimately, 
King says comedy results from a sense of things being out of place, mixed up, or not quite right. Furthermore, modality isn't just in the tone of the words being spoken or images being shown. King notes that modality can be complex and multidimensional and include elements like the use of music, sound, or opening sequences. For instance, we see how music is used when Allison Williams' character hilariously drinks a glass of milk segregated from a bowl of Fruit Loops while listening to the song, I've Had the Time of My Life. Both sound and even the use of color are funny in context. The cheery tune calls attention to the incongruity of a diabolical character drinking a wholesome glass of milk while literally looking for the next mark for her parents' weirdo gang of brain-swapping yuppies. At the same time, the flat-out bizarre method of cereal consumption defies common sense. Seriously, she doesn't even eat an entire Fruit Loop in one bite. Or let's look at how characters, narrative, and tone can combine to create a comedic mode. Take the opening scene of last year's Halloween reboot, in which a couple of true crime podcasters attempt to interview Michael Myers. The whole sequence is full of self-aware commentary on true crime culture and the commodification of popular criminal personalities. We're, we're making a podcast and- We're investigative uh, journalists. You can see the modality of comedy working its way in, even as the film prepares us for lots of bloodshed. And of course, we can't talk about modern comedy without dealing with Marvel which has basically turned the superhero film into a debatably knee-slapping comedic experience with silly one-liners. And he did a bank seat at the crime scene, just for us. Absurdist situations. Good, because if we blow the grid, I don't want to lose a tiny here in the 1950s. Excuse me? And all the self-aware humor you could want. Noob Master, hey, it's Thor again. You know, the God of Thunder? Listen, buddy, if you don't log off this game immediately, I'm gonna fly over to your house, come down to that basement you're hiding in, rip off your arms, and shove them up your butt! Now, one caveat. We think it's reasonable to assume that in simpler times of filmmaking, it would have made more sense to view comedy as a genre. That's because before the late 1950s, films typically conformed pretty neatly into defined categories, and were less likely to borrow from one another. It was unlikely that you would see a sci-fi drama like Arrival or a funny drama like Juno. Wicked Tiger. He looks proud. As a result, comedy may have acted more like a consistent genre and less like a mode. But today, we're seeing genres become increasingly more unstable. Just because we're in our rooms doesn't mean we're sleeping. Fine, I don't know, go back to your rooms. Guys, we have to be out of here at 10 a.m. tomorrow sharp, so. Hello? Oh my God. Indeed, films today are more likely to take a buffet style approach to genre. Oftentimes, these are used to appeal to more media-savvy audiences who have come to recognize tropes in a more conscious way. As this happens, we see comedy becoming almost like ambient background music. Once we start thinking of comedy as mode rather than a genre, it becomes clear that our comic sensibilities are not only alive, but perhaps even thriving. With the world an ever larger dumpster fire, maybe we're in need of a laugh more than ever, even if we're not seeking it in the form of a washed up newscaster and his accidental profanity. Go f yourself, San Diego. And of course, if you're looking for a laugh, just turn on the TV, where comedy is more than alive and well in the form of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, South Park, Rick and Morty, BoJack Horseman, Silicon Valley, and on and on and on. Even still, we'd say comedy is also surviving on the big screen as a mode. And if you agree with King, that's all it ever was in the first place. So. What do you guys think? Is comedy and film deader than Uncle Ben after another Spider-Man reboot? Or totally alive and well in unexpected ways? And for gosh sake, watch your language. That's not going away anytime soon. Are you digging Jordan Peele's brave new world of horror comedies? Or do you miss the days of Tom Cruise running a brothel in risky business? Let us know in the comments. And a big thanks to all our dope patrons who support the channel on our podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And before you go, I wanna give another shout out to Wix. With Wix's premium plans, you can connect your own domain and get 20 gigabytes of storage, unlimited bandwidth, and so much more. Create your own unique website today by going to wix.com slash wisecrack and get 15% off all yearly plans by using promo code wisecrack15. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace.